Sports journalism in today's media, up next on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Merrill Brown, Director of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Joining me today to talk about the current state of sports journalism are Kelly Whiteside, Assistant Professor for Sports Media and Journalism, and Mark Rosenwick, Associate Professor of Television and Digital Media here at Montclair State. Both have built impressive sports journalism careers for themselves. In the past 20 years, Kelly has covered many sports-related stories for USA Today, Newsday, and Sports Illustrated. She was also the first and only female president of the Football Writers Association of America. Mark has spent more than three decades as a television reporter, producer, executive producer, and program executive. He was part of the program management team that launched the Yes Network for the New York Yankees. And here at Montclair State, he's developed a curriculum for a student learning concentration in sports media and journalism, which is what brought Kelly to Montclair State just this fall. Kelly, Mark, welcome. Thank you. The sports journalism world has changed dramatically since your careers began. Uh, at that point, sports journalism was dominated by big names like Sports Illustrated and the Sporting News. There was a television show called Wide World of Sports, which, is, which was a dominant television show on ABC. It was a much different world. Today's world is about blogs, talk radio, sites people never heard of 25 years ago. What are the implications of all that, Mark? Well, I think it's, it's a matter of concern for me as a, uh, as a sports media person. A couple of years ago, I did a survey of over a hundred sports media uh, employees and, and journalists and so on and they said they're very concerned about uh, bloggers who have no credentials who are blogging in their basement with no contacts no credentials false information the rush to be first rather than being right they have editors who are breathing down their necks and want to be the first to break something online and it takes a, a reporter a lot of courage today to say I'm not ready yet I don't have this uh, fully confirmed and the last issue is, is uh, conflicts of interest, that there are too many people who have associations, affiliations with websites that might be owned and, and operated by teams. We'll come back to each one of those okay. issues. <laughs> Kelly, what's your point of view on the dramatic changes at hand? Well, one thing I'd like to add to what Mark said is it's, it's interesting that now Derek Jeter is a publisher. You know, he retires from the Yankees, and then he starts up this website called um, the Players' Tribune, uh, and he wants to deliver unfiltered sports news uh, straight from athletes to its audience and um, it's going to be an interesting experiment because right now you know I just read the other day um, Blake Griffin had done a column um, you know and, and he's like a, a managing editor and he writes the column and then autographs it at the end and it's it's very well written so I he you know who knew Blake Griffin had such writing talents um, but which goes back to the fact is who's really writing these stories um, and just it's another way to kind of, you know, push aside the mainstream media and the people who do reporting for a living um, and, and just sort of deliver the content directly to the viewers. But Kelly, Mark, there's more of it than ever, and a lot of it is very good. The investigative reporting at places like uh, ESPN can be very good. The New York Times seems more and more committed to investigative reporting about sports. We have Bleacher Report and SB Nation. We have talk radio in every major community in America. There is more sports journalism of sorts being produced now than ever before, and yet you're troubled by it. Kelly? Yeah, it, it goes back to who is editing um, the content that goes out there. Um, and, you know, th the structure has changed dramatically um, given you know, everybody can put out information on, on you know, the BuzzFeeds, the Gawkers, um, kind of citizen journalism, um, and it just raises questions about who's going to ask the hard questions, um, who's going to do the investigative work. I mean, ESPN should be lauded for work that they've done recently um, with Ray Rice and, and the Baltimore Ravens and Roger They Nadell. broke the definitive Ray Rice story, they the behind-the-scenes story they of did. what really transpired. So there. it's not like investigative journalism is going away it's just very few media outlets 
have the resources to do it, and, that, and that's very troubling. But it's also challenging for us, not only as sports journalists, but as, as viewers, as audience members, because the Ray Rice story was really broken by TMZ, mm -hmm. and they're the ones who right. first said that Michael Jackson had died, and nobody would touch that for 20 minutes until the LA mm -hmm. Times confirmed it. So there are these well, they sources, were right, though. Right, and yeah. they are, but they were wrong because two weeks ago they were wrong when they said Jer Derek Jeter was going to get married over the weekend, and it, it didn't happen. Uh, but we can't ignore them. That's, that's the key right now. Yeah. There are these outlets that periodically get these exclusives. Some of them may be practicing checkbook journalism, but we have to make note of them and check it out for ourselves and confirm it with our own sources. Checkbook journalism being news outlets paying sources for stories. Right. Um, one of the, we can't ignore the mammothness, although we're talking about small blogs to a certain extent as well, but the mammothness and dominance in our sports culture of ESPN. It is the most significant sports entity by reach and by profitability by almost any measure that's ever been created, probably anywhere in the world. Is that troubling or is that a great asset? Kelly? I, I think it's troubling in the sense that there's no competitor. You know, when there's no competition, it's a monopoly. Um, and I would have loved to have seen Fox Sports rise. Um, it had ambitions uh, in, in terms of starting a, a nightly news program. What they've done in soccer is terrific, but it can't compete. I mean, it's... It can't be competed with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Fox can't compete with right. ESPN. Right. I mean, it's just so enormous. Um, they it's compete such a with ESPN on rights issues. They may not compete exactly. on breaking news necessarily. Or viewership. Troubling, Mark? Well, because of the potential conflicts of interest, sure. I mean, I remember a few years ago when Ben Roethlisberger was accused of, of uh, mm -hmm. uh, abusing a woman, sexually uh, abusing her, and so on. Uh, there was a period of time where ESPN wouldn't touch that story, and a lot of people were reporting it. They came under a lot of criticism, claiming that it was their relationship with the NFL, and finally certain events took place where they had no choice but to jump into the story. Uh, I think they've been more careful about that since then. I think they, they learned something from it. But, you know, as, as we say in ethics class, if somebody has business interests and they're in conflict with the public's right to know, there's a potential problem there. As long as it's not tra as long as it's transparent, though, it doesn't that solve the problem. They're pretty good about acknowledging what they own rights to, right? Yeah, but but I think people when they sit there and watch Sports Center, they don't think about is this somebody who's paying billions to the NFL or the NBA. They think about what they're being presented at that time. They don't distinguish between the two as an audience. Right, and if you're reading a if you're reading a daily newspaper that had a controlling interest or even an investment in another property, they would disclose that right in the middle of that story. ESPN would never well, couldn't probably practically say, you know, while in the middle of NFL coverage, we're in business with the NFL. Close paren, right? Yeah, and, and the lines are so blurred, and and that brings to mind the situation with uh, Bill Simmons, who, on his podcast, called Roger Goodell a liar and then was subsequently suspended for three weeks, ESPN, ESPN saying that it didn't meet their journalistic standards. But, you know, I, it goes back to, yeah, why is he not allowed to say a lie, that, he, that you know, Goodell is a liar? Is it because of ESPN's relationship with the league? You know, should he have been suspended? Well, he, he, he did, wasn't in a position to prove that mm -hmm. the commissioner was a liar, mm -hmm. right? It was right. an accusation as opposed to a reported fact. Right. Trouble troubling you? Does that trouble you? I mean, he yeah, basically no, I, said in a commentary mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. facts that a leading figure in sports is a liar. No, I, I, I think it, it, despite my personal feelings about Commissioner mm -hmm. Goodell, um, I, w I wouldn't say that because I don't have proof. I don't have confirmation. I think what he should be doing but just is between us. In, investigating mm -hmm. and, and digging in and trying to find it out. But, you know, this goes even, even further to the whole atmosphere at an ESPN. There was a terrific book written by Tom Shales and a co-author a few years ago, kind of the, the oral history, if you will, of, of, of ESPN, and talking about these, these conflicts, talking about how uh, women were often uh, harassed in the workplace and so on, and the fact that th this, is, this has become such a big business and such a giant, and they control so many of the rights that these issues will come up despite their best efforts sometimes. And I think that's something that we as sports journalists need to keep an eye on for the public. Even as we lament, however, the decline of some forms of sports journalism, sports journal journalism is more and more on the American and probably the global agenda as a news story, than, as a creator of news stories than it's ever been. 
We talk about race, we talk about gender, we talk about money. We talk about all the issues in sports in a more vibrant way than we did 30 years ago. I'd say that's a good thing, Mark. Don't you agree? Yeah, no, I, I do. And I, and I think there's a lot of thoughtful and good in-depth reporting. I've, I've been heartened by the Times over the past year. They've, you know, their lead story almost every day now has something meaty. It's not you know, who won or who lost last night. It's, it's something substantial, like, for example, the, uh, the hazing in the Saraville High School uh, football team. Those are important sports-related issues that are societal issues as well. And I think that we're starting to get more of that, and, and I am uh, heartened by that. We're talking about the behavior of the Florida State quarterback. We're talking at, on the national news level about the behavior of Ravens running back Ray Rice. We're talking about all these issues in a much more open, uh, uh, public way than we ever did. Good thing, right? It's a great thing. Um, and I teach, of course, sports media and society, and it's a living syllabus. I mean, mm -hmm. every day I have something new to talk about that just happened that morning that I can bring into class. And, you know, that's why I got into sports journalism is to, to write about those issues and because it cross, crosses all aspects of society. And what we've seen with Ray Rice, it's, you know, domestic violence isn't a new phenomenon, but the fact that the entire nation was talking about this issue as a result of a football player is, is a tribute to the power of sports. So a good thing. Again, you know, I, my point of view is that generally more is better. We have more today than we did. We have a different kind of coziness than we used to have. Used to be, in a, we used to live in a world where, in, in lots of daily newspapers around the country, the relationship between beat writers and sports editors and teams was pretty darn cozy, and it was very difficult to find criticism of ownerships 20, 30 years ago. You can't be an owner without being criticized today. I think all that's positive. Well, Kelly? Yeah, it is. And, and that's the plus, exactly what you're saying, the fact that there's more outlets, you know, People, traditionally, some of these outlets would not get credentials. But now, you know, blogs, you know, the dead spins sure. of the world, the big leads, whatever you think of them, you know, they sort of bring that critical eye to issues in journalism. But one of the sports. big concerns I do have is less access yeah. for journalists. There is this ongoing effort by, by teams and leagues to control the message. And... A lot of it comes through their websites and social media and so on. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, if somebody wants to interview Blake Griffin, for, for example, mm -hmm. uh, he might say, well, you know, I, always, I already wrote my column. Yeah, I already, right. already gave you my thoughts, and, and I'm, I'm unavailable. Well, there are some questions that we might have to ask that person that we don't have access to, or if we do, it's in a very controlled environment right after the game with 50 people in a room, and you might get to shout out one question. And I agree with you, there was too much of a coziness at times in the past, but now it's, at times it swings the other way and, and we don't have ample access to tell the story. And one of the pieces of that access issue is actually being defined by the leagues, right? The leagues now give us what purports to be journalism at MLB.com, at the MLB network, at team sites, and that for some teams and some leagues is sufficient for coverage of those teams. That's a real problem, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, it is. I, I, I know several people who have kind of moved over to the other side, so to speak, who spent many years either with newspapers, magazines, or both, and now write for organizations like MLB.com, and um, one, one writes for National Hockey League uh, team website, and so on. He claims that they don't bother him about the content, um, but the other person says, well, I'm basically Bud Selig's personal reporter, Bud being the commissioner of the uh, outgoing commissioner of uh, Major League Baseball. So it depends how you look at it. Um, I, I think it's something we ought to keep an eye on. Well, it doesn't really depend on how you look at it. It's actually the teams giving us journalism about the team activities, right, right. which by definition is limiting, right? right. They're not going to write about player suspensions or not going to write in great detail about player suspensions around drug issues or harassment of women or any of those issues in any detail whatsoever. They're going to give us game stories, and they're pretty good. We know who homered in the seventh inning. Good statistics, fantasy leagues, all right. that cool stuff. Um, if you go to the Baseball Hall of Fame and you, and, you, know, you do an extensive uh, tour, you'll see that in one corner on one wall there's a paragraph that talks about steroids, and that's it. There's no, you know, there's no further discussion or, or anything like that. 
So I think there are ways that people try to sanitize things and control the message that we should be concerned about. But that's not brand new either. But with the social media and the websites, they're able to control it even more today. But it is brand new that significant, serious, experienced journalists are working for leagues and teams, quote unquote, covering those leagues and teams. You probably have friends who are in that situation and they're earnest and <laughs> trying to do their best, but it's perilous, right? Yeah, and it's a result of, of you know, mainstream media you know, contracting and losing jobs. Um, that a whole new area of, of job openings um, exists because these leagues are going into publishing. Um, yeah, and it, and it is. It's, it's for someone who spent their, their career at a newspaper or a magazine to suddenly, you know, be censored in, in a way, um, you know, is a huge career shift. In the same way that we have this new behemoth ESPN that dominates so much of sports journalism, in local markets, a new or newish and dominant force is talk radio. In New York, there are three plus radio stations that devote at least some, if not all, of their time to sports talk. That is how fans are in touch increasingly with the sports news in their communities. Kelly, is this a bad thing or just life in the fast lane? Yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, I think it is what it is. I don't think anybody confuses, um, you know, Mike Francesa or Chris Russo with, you know, traditional journalism. And you know, everybody has a, a team. You'll Mike Francesa hear. might be offended by that. He might be. Uh -huh. um, that's okay, though. Okay. Um, but everybody has a has a team. You know, which. Um, which analyst or what's which sportscaster or wh what team he roots for so it's it's more of a fandom um, type of outlet as opposed to a serious journalism. But the beat reporters on the sports talk stations in mm -hmm. big markets like New York, Washington, LA, they cover the teams in a fairly serious way. Aren't they doing valuable work, Mark? Yeah, I mean we have Sweeney Murdy who covers the Mets for WFAN. He does an excellent job. job uh, it covers the Yankees rather than Ed Coleman with the Mets. Um, I think there's a tremendous place for the sports radio. I find it very entertaining. But even more importantly, as, as a, as a uh, media person, it's good for business. The, you know, WFAN bills a tremendous amount of, of commercial time every year and, and, and so on. So I think that you have a very viable media business on a radio medium that is not necessarily flourishing in all areas. And it's entertainment for the public as long as people understand that, that it's not the gospel, it's not... Um, it's not the New York Times or Sports Center. It is infotainment. But That's you mentioned the beat reporter at the New York, uh, on, on the, the fan who covers the Yankees. Mm -hmm. He can be trusted in the same way the beat reporter at the New York Times for the New York Yankees can be trusted, can he? Oh, absolutely. He's not yeah. on anybody's payroll. And, he and, does good work. And in he? some ways, he's, he's more plugged in because he's kind of snooping around and he can pick up the phone and call it in at any time. So I think that's more valuable to the audience. So sports radio is taking the place in some ways of our one connection to sports teams historically, which was the daily newspaper. What, what does the collapse of the daily newspaper business mean in all this? And Kelly, do you think new things will replace it? You just left a daily newspaper this year. I mean, the hope is that digital media will, will save the print industry. I mean... Or at least the, the uh, words industry. Exactly, mm -hmm. the words industry. You know, but the business model is not there yet. Who knows where this is headed? Um, but yeah, it's it's, it's just a, a shift that's been going on for the last um, 15 years in terms of uh, outlets. Um, you know, at Gannett, what's happening at the Des Moines Register and the Tor Detroit News? They're drastically um, changing the structure of their staffs. There's huge layoffs. Um, kind of the, the the soul of those newspapers are leaving. Um, you know, so it's, it's, there's so much transition at this time in terms of the, the traditional legacy media outlets that it's, you know, who knows where it's going to head. Is the soul of their sports coverage disappearing as well in terms of covering the local teams? Well, in terms of personnel, they have um, one of their, a former sports editor who's their lead sports columnist who I've worked with. Um, We're talking about who knows? Des Moines, Des Moines Register. Register. Des Moines Register. Uh -huh. Des Moines Register. Um, decided not to re-interview re for his job. Mm. Um, and I, I'm not sure what he's going to do, but just the fact that the people who have built that section over the last couple decades, um, a lot of them aren't staying because of they're concerned about where the organization is headed. You know, that's, that's not a good thing. Mark, the death of the Daily Newspaper? Well, I think you know, one of the things we've been talking about on campus, we had a great guest the other day talking about 
the expansion of video and television on different platforms. And I think that even when people write blogs today, they should be including, as many of them do, links to videos that illustrate what they're talking about. I think that is a, a tremendous area of, of growth for sports and, and other beats as well. And I think that every time I go online, that's, that's what I'm looking for. But, you know, the other thing, too, is I, I do want to say something complimentary about ESPN, too, because I was mm -hmm. trashing them and you, you were more kind than I was. The other night I saw their new documentary on the point shaving scandal at Boston College in basketball from the 90s. And it was excellent. And my wife, who is not a sports fan, sat next to me and watched the whole thing. And I was shocked. And she said, this is great storytelling. This is an important story and how these people's lives were changed. They had the mobsters being interviewed. They had the former players and so on. So there's, there is a place for tremendous video and documentary that we can access that I think is a real plus on the sports beat. And we have a, a global platform for it, right, called digital, called the Internet. Right. Our program we're taping today at Montclair State University will be on the web uh, quite soon and seen in theory by people around the world. That's a great thing, right? Absolutely. And, of course, now you have, within the last few days, CBS announcing for, what, $6 a month you can access their programming online. And that's, that's where it's going. So it, it, it is becoming even more of a global entity, and, and sports is in the forefront with soccer and other, uh, other sports. Kelly, why is it that we're spending so much time talking about gender and race in sports these days? Um, is the story now kind of caught up with the reality of the world that when it was undercovered, or is there more going on about it? What's the reality of the story? Um, I think it's being covered better, um, and I think people are more comfortable talking about these issues. Um, one thing I want to bring up, too, that since we mentioned CBS, is CBS Sports just launched a show um, entirely of female journalists or uh, former female athletes. And, you know, the fact that that's happening now, or maybe it took so long to happen, um, is interesting. Um, so I think we're hearing uh, from, from women who have different perspectives, maybe, you know, from what we're used to seeing on ESPN and elsewhere. Um, in terms of race, I think culturally, we're more comfortable discussing about it, and, and sports gives us uh, a way to get into those issues um, that may feel more comfortable than, than politics. Is there a women's perspective on sports that you would have or that the people on that program would have that's different? Sometimes, yeah, I think so. Um, I think what the, is it? the issues, well, the issues we're talking about today, you know, some of the domestic violence issues um, in terms of the Ray Rice story, um, his now wife was criticized for her response initially um, to, the, to the allegations and, and maybe women may look at that differently um, and, and look at sort of the cycle of domestic violence and sort of how traditionally um, the victim responds differently than how uh, people outside that situation would respond. So yeah, I think we all bring our perspectives into to every story and, and just being able to re relate also to female athletes differently than, than male sports writers, so yeah. There's also a lot of controversy, of, you know, we're reviewing uh, the turbulent 2014 in many ways, mm -hmm. a lot of co controversy about changes in sideline reporters and women's personalities mm -hmm. and age and so on and so forth. Lay out that issue for us and what's your perspective on those changes at, I guess, Fox, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I always say when people ask me about women in sports media and how many women are in sports media, um, the perspective is always you turn on the TV and there's a sideline reporter that's always a woman. It's like mandatory apparently that you have to be a, a female sideline reporter. Um, so those opportunities have been created and that's great, but it hasn't transitioned over to other areas of the media in terms of women in well, sports you've, journalism. You've examined this issue a bit. Why is it that the sideline reporter is always a woman? Um, well, she's also usually blonde, so that might have something to do with some issues um, and tends to be on the younger side, so that might play into it. I mean, what we dealt with this year is Pam Oliver, a, an excellent reporter for Fox, um, is no longer, you know, the lead, um, and the, the lead sideline reporter. And she wrote very honestly and interestingly about the issue, you know, is it age? Um, you know, you simply get older and, and you're replaced by someone younger, and that's a whole television issue. She was replaced issue. by somebody, what, 15, 20 years younger exactly. than she is? Exactly, exactly. Uh, Aaron, right? Aaron. Aaron Andrews. Aaron Andrews. Mm -hmm. Mark, what's your perspective on that? Why are women, uh, why do they have the monopoly on sideline reporters on well, football the, games? Well, I, I, I should say the, you know, the majority are women, but there are some 
also very talented men who are doing sideline reporting as well. Um, I think that it's a cosmetic media, medium. Television is, is superficial in a lot of ways. But, but then again, we have a lot of women who are extremely talented who would like to do play-by-play -play and are denied the opportunity to do that. But then again, we have some extremely bright people. Uh, one of them uh, is Ali LaForce, who's 25 years old. Mm -hmm. She's a graduate of my alma mater, Ohio University. I had to get that plug in there. Um, and, you know, she deserves to be there despite her age, despite the fact that she was Miss Teenage Ohio. She has... Uh, and where's her work? Where does she work? She, well, she, she is, uh, she's a sideline reporter for SEC games on CBS Sports mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, March Madness. And she is also featured on the, uh, the talk show that the uh, female journalists are doing that Kelly just... Uh, so we have a circumstance where women reporters dominate the sidelines and yet are underrepresented in the booth. Right. right, and we're making some progress on that, but it's relatively slow, isn't it, Kelly? It is slow, um, and not that I want to be this shill for CBS, this show, but it, it's terrific. It's called um, "We Need to Talk," and it's they've had three episodes so far, and it's fabulous. And by the um, way, I just heard the phone ring. Your book, uh, <laughs> your right. book on the next episode. You're, you're looking for a book, <laughs> no, okay? No, no it, it really is, and it's um, it just goes to show that that. The talent is there. One of the, the, the women on the show um, is a former CEO of the Oakland Raiders. Um, and she's now in, on CBS as an analyst. And before she left the Oakland Raiders, I had no idea, um, you know, really anything about her. And, and she's an excellent voice that could easily do um, be the analyst on, on any broadcast game. Mark, in the NFL. Yeah, why is it so slow that we're, we've been able to get more? women into the broadcast booth. Why is it taking so long? Well, I, I, I just think it is uh, it is an old boys club. I mean, I, you know, I worked at the Yes Network, and mm -hmm. there, there weren't a lot of women there. We did, we did um, have Susan Waldman do color on some games for us, and then she switched over to the radio side. And I think it's, it's a matter of training. It's also a societal thing, the fact that you know, women have been told for many years, you're not going to do play-by-play, -play, so you might as well be well quaffed and, and be on the sidelines someplace. And, you know, unfortunately, not enough of them have, have fought that trend. Um, but, yeah, I think that will gradually change, too. I'm sure it will, and we'll be continuing to have these discussions because sports is vibrant and provocative. Thank you all for joining us today. If you'd like more information about Carpe Diem, you can write to us at the email address on your screen, carpediem at mail.montclair.edu, or call us at 973-655-5158. For Carpe Diem, I'm Merrill Brown. Thanks for watching.